uh, when it comes to your day of judgment. Rebbein uh, Shlomo, I did not pay attention. I did not examine him. I did not give him the third degree to find out whether he really needs it or whether it's just tricking me. Uh, he says he needed it, so I gave it to him. So tit for tat, God will treat you the same way. What about giving too much? Too much? Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> there's a limit. There's a limit which the Gemara says, "Some of us must He who expends his money should not expend more than a fifth, meaning twenty percent. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, the Baal Shem Tov said on that, "Hamevasbeis." The word "mevasbeis" comes from the word "bizbus." Uh, they all can come from "bizo." "Bizo" means disposal of war. If you look at charity at Stockholm. That this is bizarre, that it's kind of forced out of you. I have to give. It's not nice what people say if I don't give them, etc. So, yes, I give, but I give it grudgingly. So, if a person gives it grudging, grudgingly, God says, Do me a favor, don't give me more than 20%. But there, where a person enjoys it, he really wants to help and it makes him feel good, he can help a person, he can give 30, 40% also. It's certainly no worse than when you buy a car. You buy yourself a Lexus, you buy yourself a Mercedes etc etc you don't look at uh, what your accountant says how much you can afford you don't look at it's 20% of my income or 30% of my income or 50% of my income you even go into debt just to buy that so if a person gets enjoyment out of giving stock uh, how is that person buying a painting or a carpet or a car so then by all means do so <coughs> never mind there where you do as it says in Tanya where you do so that when it comes to medicine you don't look at the expense either you go into debt to get the medicine just to survive. So when it comes to spiritual survival, uh, for kapor, for sins, etc., etc., nowadays if we can fast, nowadays we don't have kabonas, so therefore we can, uh, we can redeem our sins by means of uh, giving to charity, if you have that in mind. And there the Al-Tarebbe says explicitly, you don't have to worry about uh, being violating the Alibasus Yosem Mechaymash. All of a sudden, some people are very meticulous about that. Uh, but they're not meticulous about uh, the, the minimum of uh, other mitzvahs. Here they're very meticulous about um, a maximum. The same as uh, they say about what we just read last Shabbos, Pasha Shkolim, that the rich shall not give more than half a shekel, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. The rich are very meticulous in that. To make sure, no, I'm not going to give more than half a shekel. No, I'm not going to give more than half a shekel. So I'm not going to give more than half a shekel. Okay, next one. All right, but, um with no new revelations today and so many different interpretations of what Hashem wants from us, how or is it even possible for someone to be sure he's actually doing what God wants from him? Well, it's basically the answer that already. Uh, how many revelations do you need? If the revelation at Sinai is not good enough, then the revelation today will not mean anything more either. Because then tomorrow you'll question... Yeah, but what about the revelation yesterday? What does it mean to me? I want another revelation today. And then what the revelation you had in the morning is not good enough for the afternoon. And, uh, Three not thousand good years later, how do we know that maybe someone pulled the eye, pulled the, the same, The same way as you would know about the revelation you had this morning. Or the same way you would know about the revelation you had even this evening. How do you know it really happened? So the same criteria that you would apply to that, you apply to this. When we talk about past, Past is not something of three and a half thousand years ago. Past is something of one split second ago. Something which is not now, here and now, is part of the past. And once we deal with the past, whether it's one second, one minute, one hour, one day, one month, one year, one decade, one century, or one millennium ago, makes absolutely no difference. What are your criteria for establishing reality? What are your criteria for establishing uh, the veracity of something that is being passed on? That's the question you can ask about all of history. Never mind what happened a minute ago. Well, how do you know it was a World War II? How do you know World War I? American Civil War. Columbus coming to America. Alexander the Great. The same as you know about any of these things, the same you know about Sinai. And the same criteria that you use for verifying the assuredness of what happened a split second ago, especially if you have to relate that and confirm that to somebody else, like in the example I gave you before, where were you this evening? So your word, I may not necessarily take at face value. So then you give me certain evidence, certain arguments, why you give that. It's exactly the same with regards to anything of the past. So the amount of time that has passed is irrelevant. The criteria remain the same. 
the most important thing is your question, what do I base my sense of reality on? Just as there's such a thing as a history of philosophy, which gives you the history of all the philosophers, likewise there's such a thing called philosophy of history, where they discuss what ex- how do we know history? How do we know anything of history? What is a history book? History books, basically, there's no such thing. You have lots of history books, there's not one history book that tells the truth. Every history book is an interpretation. The proof you have that in different countries they'll give you the same events uh, in some different ways. For that matter, in my library, I have two history books. One world history and one American history. And the whole, they're written completely different than all other history books. All I have from beginning of the world history is that thick. All it has is just dates and next to the date a certain event. It doesn't tell me anything about the event. Just that that event happened in that year. It's as objective a history text as you could possibly get. Other history books what they would do, every history book will do that, every book that you have in school will do that, will tell you why did this happen. They will relate one event to another event. <coughs> and say this became the cause of that. Uh, Napoleon invaded Russia. Why did Napoleon invade Russia? Anybody here knows? I think I'm the only person in the world that knows why Napoleon invaded Russia. Maybe he had a big inferiority complex. Huh? <laughs> a little guy like him? Yeah, he, why did he invade Russia? Point. I'll tell you why he invaded Russia. One morning, Napoleon got up. And the night before he had a fight with Josephine, his wife. So we went to sleep in a lousy mood and got up in a lousy mood. They brought him his coffee. The coffee wasn't hot enough and not uh, sweet enough, whatever it is. So it made his mood even more stinkier than it was before. Um, and then one of the generals comes in, comes in. Um, uh, Your Majesty, we have, we have invaded uh, Holland, we have invaded uh, Switzerland, we have invaded uh, Italy, we have invaded all of, we have all of you, what should you do? Go invade Russia, I would write here. Okay, the army went to Russia. Is that possible? Is it possible? Just because he was in a stinky mood, and uh, just yelled out impulsively whatever came to his mind, just to get rid of the general now, he couldn't deal with it, because of the lousy coffee or because of his fight with his wife, you would be surprised how many such decisions have been made throughout history. But nobody would ever know about it. We know it from our own experience. Each and every one of us knows how we have made certain snap judgments and snap decisions simply because we are in a certain type of mood. Which later on we could have, we could have changed our mind, but then it's already too late. So is that possible? Of course it's possible. So therefore, every history book, what they will do, they do, they are not uh, privy to the secrets what went on there. They will relate things from what we know. We know he did this, we know he did that, we know he had this attitude, that attitude. So we will relate one thing to another and establish a whole theory of causality. That A causes B, and B leads to C, and C leads to D, etc., etc. Now that history book which I have doesn't do any of these things. Whenever you have taken a history text in school, they will ask you not just what happened, they will ask you why did it happen. But these, why did it happen, these are value judgments. Which each historian, who has his own historical, you cannot be a Marxist historian, you can be a different type of historian, and you will always interpret it according to your basic uh, outlook upon life and uh, the political, historical events that go on. My history book doesn't do these things. All it does is just tell you, he invaded Russia. On that day he did this, on that day he did that. Now, here you have an objective history book, right? My answer is, no, wrong. That's just as subjective as all the other ones. Why? Because in that very same year that they bring me event A, B, C, D, guess what? There were at least a thousand other events. How come they don't mention any of the other thousand events? Ah, the other ones are not so important. This one is important. Why do we say this is important, the others are not important? Oh, because this had effects, this had led to other things. So implicitly, behind, in between the lines, they also give an interpretation. So history is full of interpretations. <coughs> so if you forget about the interpretations, uh, what are you left with? Basically, it's just dates and events. And events are literally an infinity of events. Um, now, even the events, how do you know about events? Take a Russian history book about World War II. 
Take an English history book about World War II. Take a Polish or uh, American history book about World War II. They will all mention the exact same events. But each one will give a completely different story about exactly what happened. The Russians claim, still understand it, oh, we were, we were the ones who conquered uh, Germany. We are the ones who really brought to the downfall of Hitler, etc., etc. The Americans will give it from their perspective, but they saw the French, from their perspective, the English, from their perspective, etc., etc. We are talking about, as a matter of fact, there is a book called Napoleon, which a Dutch journalist was interned uh, during World War II. All he could do is he had access to a library, and that's all he could do anyway. So he sat down to study, uh, not Napoleon himself, but he studied French biographies of Napoleon in the 19th century. And he discovered there were approximately 50 or 75 um, prominent biographies of Napoleon written by first rank prominent French historians. From the time of Napoleon's lifetime till middle of the 19th century or so. And these biographies of Napoleon ranged all the way from the point that Napoleon was the greatest thing that ever happened to France all the way to the other extreme, that Napoleon was the greatest tragedy that ever happened to France. Same country, his, same historians, not same historians, but they were all of the same profession, talking about one and the same facts. The facts are all the same. The data are all the same. But now it goes into interpretation. So, all we can really go then is by the, by the actual data. So, in terms of data... Um, if I have certain criteria how to determine how do I know that a certain historical event happened especially if I did not participate there myself all I can go by is the accounts of the so called eyewitnesses and when these eyewitnesses are no longer alive then all I can go by is what these eyewitnesses recorded and passed on to the next generation that's what happens with every single historical event throughout human history from day one to this day. And that's what we have with regards to Sinai. Exactly what we have. I've been once challenged by one of my professors in, in graduate school. He's the, the first one who had the guts to open his mouth. But it was very friendly, got very close to him, so that's, that's why he had the guts. So I said, I don't understand, what are you doing in philosophy? I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, that thing up there, these things down here, uh, somehow this doesn't go with philosophy. Philosophy is about questioning everything. Science is about questioning everything. It's certainly everything about religion. So religion, orthodoxy, and uh, secular philosophy, it's not science philosophy, it's general philosophy, um, somehow this seems a contradiction. And I smiled at him and I said, uh, because I'm orthodox, that's why I went into philosophy. And because I went into philosophy, that's why I'm orthodox. So he looked at me. He was Jewish also, as a matter of fact, but totally assimilated. Married to a Chinese woman. Uh, no, no, even his upbringing, his parents were totally assimilated from, from Hungarian uh, extraction. Didn't know anything about the guy. So he asked me to explain. So I gave him a short explanation of Revelation at Sinai. Five, ten minutes, that's all it took. He said, that's all? That's it? I said, yes, that's it. And you know something? You can do me the biggest favor in the world. I wish and pray that you could stand here now and shoot a hole through my argument. Shoot it down. I'll be eternally grateful. Because if you shoot it down, free! <laughs> I can go to McDonald's like everybody else. I can go to nightclubs like everybody else. I can fool around like everybody else. I'll be free, finally. Break down my argument. And he, he looked at me. <laughs> and he started. The basic questions always come up when you give this argument. How do you know, and how do you know there's not a corruption of the tradition? How do you this and that? All the same questions. And I answered them. And after about half hour discussion, an hour's discussion, he suddenly discovered it's not as simple as he thought it was. Often the argument sounds as the most simple argument in the world. It sounds as the most simple argument in the world because even a child can understand it. You're talking about the most momentous event in history. The most significant event. 
if I would have given him an explanation using ten syllable words, 